Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom. We have a very interesting show about an amazing historic home, the Stephen Decatur House, which is located within blocks of the White House in Washington, D.C. And we are pleased to discuss this important book with one of its authors, Catherine Malone France, and who will explain the history and describe the fabulous photographs in this book that was published by the White House Historical Association. So glad you're here, Catherine. Thank you, Lois. And our viewers should know that Catherine is the Senior Vice President for Historic Sites at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which has a portfolio of 27 historic sites around the nation, which includes the Decatur House. And now let's discuss this book on Stephen Decatur. A celebrity for his heroics in the Barbary Wars and the War of 1812, U.S. Commodore Stephen Decatur built his home in 1818 with prize money awarded to him by Congress for his military victories at sea. Decatur's time in his three-story home was cut short in 1820 when he was mortally wounded in a duel. Following his death, Decatur's wife, Susan, rented the house to many prominent Americans. This volume chronicles the history of the house and its occupants in four parts. Catherine, why is the Decatur House a must-read for those interested in American history? Oh, my goodness. Well, I, you know, the White House Historical Association has put together a beautiful book on Decatur House that really covers the span of its history from, you know, the early 19th century all the way through its 20th century life as the headquarters of the National Trust and a house museum. And so in, in that broad sweep of American history, Decatur House, standing at the corner of H Street and Jackson Place, um, a block from the White House, has witnessed so much of American history, but it has not just witnessed it, it has in many ways embodied um, important themes in American history. And so um, I think the book that the White House Historical Association put together, again, has done a beautiful job of capturing the long sweep of that history and telling that story from different perspectives. Yes, yes. And I think that, you know, I wonder how many Americans know about Stephen Decatur. Right. I mean, I want you to tell us who was he and sure. why did the White House Historical Association publish this impressive book about him and his house? Sure. Well, let's start with Stephen Decatur himself. I mean, he's a really important uh, naval hero of, of the early republic. So great were his his um, feats of, of, of yeah. bravery uh, and and daring um, that he was at the age of 25 uh, made a captain in the Navy, the youngest person uh, ever in the history of the Navy to hold that rank. Um, you know, militarily, again, the victories that we'll talk about in a bit um, are are so important in the the development of the American Navy and in our um, in the early wars in which uh, the United States engaged and was was ultimately victorious. Uh, you know, today I believe that there are 46 towns or cities named after Stephen Decatur, another seven counties Amazing. named and after Decatur, and, and countless and junior high schools and, it, you know. And streets, I know. There, streets, and, you're and, exactly right. And also, uh, the, the, there's a ship right now in, Correct. in, the, in the South China Sea. Uh, 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 USS you know, Decatur right now. Sure. Uh, right in, in, in position. So, now, well, let me ask you, where is, uh, who designed the Stephen Decatur House, and sure. where is it exactly located? Sure, sure. So, uh, Decatur House was designed by Benjamin Hen Henry Latrobe. Uh, Latrobe is, some people call him the father of American architecture, but mm. he's really the first professional architect in the United States. Um, he is best known as serving as the architect of the Capitol. Okay. Um, he was not the designer of the, the original designer of the United States Capitol, but served as an early architect of the Capitol and played a critical role in the completion of that building mm -hmm. and of its design, particularly some of its um, most iconic interior spaces. He is also the designer of parts of the White House, uh, including the North Portico of the White House, which is not very far from Decatur House. He's also the architect of St. John's Church, uh, which is also on Lafayette mm. Square. In fact, when Latrobe begins building, when he designs Decatur House, uh, he the only other two buildings in sight are the White House and St. John's and Church. Church. Yes. So in a way, it, Lafayette Square, before it is Lafayette Square, is really Latrobe's neighborhood. <laughs> yes, He's absolutely. sort of designing the, the mm. way it looks. Well, I have to as you mentioned, Stephen Decatur has been called the greatest naval hero in American history. 
I think, can you briefly describe his big naval victory in which the burning of the USS Philadelphia brought Decatur's name to the world. Sure, sure. So the the, Philly, the burning of the Philadelphia happened during the first war with the Barbary states, which is really about... Um, they're, they're pirates, right? Right. It's about American... In the, Medi in the Mediterranean. It's about American vessels mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. being captured mm -hmm. um, and their crews captured and held for ransom. And again, it's a really important um, military engagement for the young American Republic. And so what happens is in late 1830, I mean 1803, in late 1803, um, under the command of uh, Bainbridge, the Philadelphia runs aground outside the harbor in Tripoli. It runs aground on what is a sort of an uncharted reef, mm -hmm. right? So off, off North Africa. Yeah, yes, yeah. And, and right outside the harbor at mm -hmm. Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Tripolitan uh, commanders, you know, capture the ship off the the reef along with its crew, and they bring it into the harbor at Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, this is a concern to the American Navy for many reasons. They they're worried about the crew. They don't want the ship to be damaged or to be held there as exactly. this you know demonstration. And, it, of, and it's a very small navy to begin with, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so they they develop a plan mm -hmm. um, for coming into the harbor mm -hmm. at Tripoli and either returning or burning, um, <laughs> you know, the Philadelphia. Either they're going to bring the Philadelphia, if they can, recapture it, bring it, bring it, bring it out, out of the harbor, mm -hmm. repair it, and mm -hmm. then take it, you know, back to the United States ultimately, or they're going to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And so the person, um, you know, tasked with leading this command, mm -hmm. this this mission, is Stephen Decatur. So he is at the time in charge of, um, in, in command of a, of a small ship called the Intrepid. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, uh, I think it's February of 1804, uh, in command of the Intrepid, Decatur sails it into the harbor at Tripoli. Now, he does so on an almost moonless night. There is a little crescent of a moon, mm -hmm. so it's sort of under the cover of darkness. And the plan is they disguise the Intrepid to look like a trading vessel from Malta. And, it, and there's no motor here. They're just sailing. Oh, no. right? He's sailing. sailing. Now, again, Decatur is an exceptional sailor. He mm -hmm. went to sea for the first time mm -hmm. at the age of eight. Mm -hmm. His father was in, Stephen Decatur Sr. is an important naval, um, naval officer in the Revolution. Right. So the sea is in his blood. Mm -hmm. He is an excellent sailor. But he sails into to the harbor again. The ship is dis disguised, they're flying British colors, and but he's got a real challenge, right? Because he's got to get the Intrepid close enough to the Philadelphia. So they can shoot, they can mount the... So they can board it. He's, board he's it. got to get close enough to the Philadelphia to board it, but he's also got to make it look like to the rest of everyone in the harbor at Tripoli that this is just a, a Maltese trading vessel, right? right? And the winds are against him, but again, he's an excellent sailor, and so ultimately um, he is able to bring the Intrepid right alongside the Philadelphia. Now, most of his crew has been hidden below, right? And so he gives the signal, and the crew, you know, comes out, and they all board and the and Philadelphia. it's hand-to-hand hand combat then, right? Absolutely, it is. And fairly quickly, they take control of the Philadelphia. But what they see is that it's really been demasted. There's mm -hmm. no way they mm -hmm. can sail the Philadelphia out of there. Mm -hmm. So it becomes clear that they're going to have to do what they destroy plan it. to do. They're going to have to destroy it. And so they begin setting the combustion. Mm -hmm. all over the mm -hmm. all over the um, the Philadelphia and Stephen Decatur is a of course, reportedly the last person to leave mm. the Philadelphia as they are beginning to light the combustibles, gets back onto the Intrepid, and under you know under fire, they make their way out of the harbor at Tripoli and leave the Philadelphia burning. Now, you know, at every point in Stephen Decatur's career, there's always something about it that makes that makes the story even greater, right? <laughs> he is just sort of this figure he, for whom great tales are are always and, just there waiting. And he's very lucky. He's also very lucky. He's incredibly lucky, but in this case, the extra sort of twist on this is that the Philadelphia has actually been commissioned by his father. So he is essentially sort of burning the ship, yep, that commissioned is by, by, by his, his father. father. Yes. So, you know, I think part of Stephen Decatur's fame comes from the fact that in the retelling of these stories, right, mm -hmm. in the American press, mm -hmm. 
they're so romantic mm -hmm. at every turn. Yes. You know, there's the disguise, and there's the moon, there's and there's the, the wind, right. and, and there's the burning of the ship. And they, so the Americans just love him, don't exactly. they? Exactly. I mean, you know, the press just, mm -hmm. it's its not hard to make this into a really compelling story Absolute, for the American absolutely. public. Oh. Well, this book uh, yes. is, is been, has been described by four different authors. Right. And uh, can you briefly tell us who they are sure. and their contribution to the book, including yours? Sure, sure. So, um, so uh, let's see. The first uh, chapter in this is written by a man named uh, James Deturgis Kay, who is a scholar of Stephen Decatur and of okay. naval history. And so Jim wrote a great uh, chapter, which is part of actually a, a biography that he did of Stephen Decatur that really captures this sort of swashbuckling uh, Stephen Decatur. I love the military stories in this yes. book. They're just fantastic. Yes. Well, and Jim tells them very, very well. Mm -hmm. Michael Fazio, who is an architectural historian wrote the chapter on Latrobe's design mm -hmm. of Decatur House. Um, Latrobe is a tremendously important architect, mm -hmm. again, as sort of the first professional architect in the United States. But today, only three of his residential designs survive. One Ooh. of them is Decatur House. And it's a really interesting design because it is a very urban mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, that's a wonderful chapter about the sort of architectural history mm -hmm. of Decatur House. And then um, a man named Osborne Mackey, who has a background in fine arts and decorative arts, wrote a wonderful chapter about the collection at yeah. Decatur House, which spans, you know, the story of, of Stephen Decatur and the naval years mm -hmm. um, all the way through, again, the 20th, the 19th and 20th century collections of the Beale family mm -hmm. and then of the National Trust. Uh, and then I wrote the final chapter, which is about the National Trust ownership of Decatur House, which begins with a bequest in 1952 and continues to this day. And we're, and we're going to get to that. I appreciate <laughs> that. So it's a great, um, like I said, four really different perspectives mm -hmm. on an amazing place. Yes, yes, yes. And so don't be alarmed by the size because every chapter <laughs> counts here. Um, and um, so I would like to uh, start our slideshow with images from this great book. And I think we'll start with the first image of a shot of the, the Stephen Decatur House now off the busy corner of H Street Northwest and Jackson Place. I mean, what, why was this site picked for the house and how has the house changed since it was first built? Thank you. Those are great questions. Um, you know, so Decatur House, as I said, is located on Jackson Place. I believe its current address is 748 Jackson Place. Mm -hmm. um, and it is right at the corner, again, of, of H Street and Jackson Place. It is the last piece of non-federal property today that nice. faces Lafayette Square Amazing. along Madison and Jackson Places. And people can tour the house. You, they can. They Great. can. Um, and, you know, Decatur House has changed significantly over time. It has certainly been remodeled uh, several times mm -hmm. in the fashion of the day. Mm -hmm. And then last of all, uh, in the 1930s, restored to back to Latrobe's design. But it is also important to note that attached to the back of Decatur House and running along H Street is a really important building that was built shortly after Decatur House was constructed. And it is a rare example of an urban slave quarters. From about 1822 through the 1960s, this building was home to people who lived mm -hmm. there, who but also worked in the household yes, of Decatur I, I, and House. And I've read about that in the Washington Post. It's very interesting. It's uh, a really important uh, building, uh, as are the stories of the people, members yeah. of the King and Williams families, right. a woman named Rosa Marks, a woman named Nancy Syfax, mm -hmm. who were enslaved in this building. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, even today, the slave quarters at Decatur House is the last piece of sort of preserved physical evidence that people were held in bondage within sight of the White House. Yes, yes. And it's an incredibly important uh, uh, place to visit. And, and next is on, on page 46, we have Stephen Decatur's dramatic fight with a captain from Tripoli that almost cost him his life. Yes. Now, what happened here? Sure, and that is a very dramatic painting. Again, yes. part of how yes. the stories of Stephen Decatur spread, yes. right, were these sort of dramatic images. Uh, this one is when he is avenging the, the, the murder of his brother. So his brother... His brother James, Yes, right? his yes. brother James Pine Decatur was also there in the first Barbary War. And so this happens 
not long after the burning mm -hmm. of the Philadelphia. And um, they were, uh, James Pine Decatur is killed in a skirmish. He's mm -hmm. mortally wounded, mm -hmm. I should say, in a skirmish. Decatur is also in that skirmish. It's like a bunch of little gunboats mm -hmm. skirmishing mm -hmm. in the in the harbor at Tripoli. And so, um, so as the battle rages on, Stephen Decatur is told that his brother has been mortally wounded. Mm -hmm. So he finds out which ship has the the captain who's killed his brother, and so he, he goes, goes right, go right there. there. Yeah, he goes right, right there um, to, to and get his um, revenge, yeah. finds him and engages in uh, this very dramatic fight with him. I think which ends and when, this captain is much bigger, physically bigger than him. Well, that's certainly what the painting tells us. And <laughs> um, and you know, I think it ends when Decatur actually pulls out his pistol and shoots the um, the Tripolitan captain at very close range. Mm -hmm. uh, and then actually he leaves, uh, goes back to the Constitution, which is where his brother is dying, mm -hmm. and is able to be with James Dine, Pine Decatur as he dies. Oh, it, it's, it's a really dramatic painting. And next on page 81 is a watercolor on the battle between the, the British frigate, the Macedonian, and the USS United States in 1816. I mean, who won, and can you briefly tell us about sure, this battle? Sure, sure. It's a really important battle in the War of 1812. Um, so basically, uh, Stephen Decatur has become the um, the captain of the United States, the USS United States, in 1810. And in 1812, he is part of um, a squadron that is sailing east um, and patrolling sort of off the coast of the United States. But ultimately, Decatur breaks off from that and continues sailing eastward in command of the USS United States. And so they are about 500 miles, I think, south of the Azores, when against the horizon, they see a sail. And then as they come up onto the horizon, the ship comes into view. Mm -hmm. And they immediately, Decatur immediately recognizes that it is the HMS Macedonian because in 1810, the United States and the Macedonian had been berthed next to each other at Norfolk, and their captains had actually argued back and forth against which was the better which was the better ship. Um, the the so the Macedonian was British though. It is, but it had been in Norfolk mm -hmm. um, before the war had started. Oh, I see. You know, they were berthed next to each other, and their captains knew each other. Um, the The United States is a little bit bigger than the Macedonian. The United States is a forty four gun frigate, and I think the Macedonian only has. 38 guns. Okay. Um, and no, but they're pretty close. But yeah. they're pretty close. Yeah. And um, supposedly the guns from uh, the United States had a longer range. Good. So basically, <laughs> as soon as they see the Macedonian, they recognize that it's the HMS Macedonian and they begin firing on it from this great distance. Now, I think the story is that the, um, the United States gets off 70 broadsides and the Macedonian is able to only respond with. 30 broadsides. Mm. So again, they pretty much, Decatur pretty much destroys the Macedonian from a distance mm -hmm. and then takes the Macedonian and brings it back to the United States as a prize of war. That's right, because I think he was supposed to, with, with the American Navy, they rewarded these these uh, prizes to commanders who brought back right. ships. And now, exactly right. And he did not get a prize the first time he had won so this was that he was determined to make sure the ship made it back to the United States. Exactly. <laughs> to give and proof that, yes, it's exactly. been conquered, right? Exactly. And it's some of that prize money that he uses to build Decatur House. Yes. And it was like, I guess it was like $200,000. It's a huge amount of money at the time. And so and so, so his crew got all, all got some money. Right. And, and he got like 30000 of that. Right. But yeah. Right. But again, you know, it's just another story that helps to build his fame. And next we have a shot of Japanese panels on the page... 350, 351. What is the story behind these panels? Sure, they're beautiful. And they're such a good illustration of how um, internationally connected uh, the Beale family was, the second, the third family to own uh, Decatur House. They, um, they were given to the Beale family sometime after they purchased Decatur House in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. And then they have most recently been beautifully restored by the White House Historical Association. And I think that the White House Historical Association has done some research that leads them to believe that the panels might have been a gift from President Grant to his friend Edward Beale, who owned Decatur House. Uh, President Grant went to Japan mm -hmm. on a tour right 
right after he finished his term in office. So I think about 1879, uh, Edward Beale, who he'd appointed the foreign minister to, I mean, the ambassador to Austria-Hungary at the time, had just come back to Decatur House, which mm -hmm. he owned. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps they were a present from uh, President Grant. Now, when you visit the Decatur House, you can see these pamphlets. You can, and they are spectacular. They've been beautifully restored by the White House mm. Historical Association. Another reason to go there. Indeed. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, next uh, is a 19th century engraving depicting uh, Decatur's final adversary, oh. Commodore James Barron. Sure. Well, you, can you tell us about that duel? Sure. That is so sad. Sure. It is incredibly tragic. I mean, again, like all of Stephen Decatur's life, sort of, it unfolds like a novel yes, in or, some or ways. It, it could be a film, you actually. Know, oh, totally. Um, so James Barron has been... Um, he's older than Decatur, Commodore Barron, and he's been sort of Decatur's mentor yes. in, in the Navy when Decatur is young. But um, just prior to the War of 1812, um, uh, Barron is in command of a ship called the USS Chesapeake, mm -hmm. and uh, he ends up surrendering it to the British. Mm -hmm. And after the War of 1812, he's court-martialed for this. And Decatur is, by that time, one of three uh, Navy commissioners here in Washington, D.C. It's the appointment that mm -hmm. he's given mm -hmm. after the War of 1812. And so... Um, he decides in favor of the court martial. Mm -hmm. And so he and James Barron have a long correspondence um, arguing about that. Yes, Barron was shocked that he had yes. approved that a court martial. Yes, <clears throat> I mean, again, he's, you know, he's sort of come up, you know, brought him up in the Navy right. with him in a way. Right. Yeah. And so they have this very, tense. very polite but tense, Relation. formalized Relation. correspondence back and forth, sort of arguing mm -hmm. about this. But at a point, there's nothing left to say except in the sort of culture of that time, we take this to the dueling grounds. <laughs> and so that's what they do. Um, in, uh, I think it's March the 22nd, 1820, they go to the dueling grounds at Bladensburg, Maryland. The story is Stephen Decatur doesn't even tell his wife, Susan no. Decatur, that he's leaving that day. Yes. Um, they go out with their seconds. Now, the story is that, you know, they are supposedly both aiming to wound, yes. right? Not to kill. Now, Baron is older. Than Decatur. So he can't see that well. Well, and so there are, uh, you know, there are accounts that say his hand was a little shaky, he couldn't see very well, mm. whatever the case. Mm. He did not shoot to wound. He he mortally wounded yes. um, yeah. Stephen Decatur. Yes. And so, but he is not killed immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so he is put into a carriage and taken back to Decatur House. <laughs> and, and, um, and then it arrives, his poor wife sees his, her husband bleeding to death on, her, on the floor. Well, he doesn't even let that happen. He sends her away and he's brought into a room there where he dies late mm. that night. Mm, 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 mm. And the thing is, what's so ironic is because when Decatur was... Um, in charge of the navy, and I mean, with a ship, he was telling people, "Do not have duels. Come to me and let let me right. see if I can right. figure out how to just stop this from happening." Because he was right. he was against duels. Right. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Um, then now we have um, a picture of a watercolor of the Stephen Decatur House in 1822, and it, it shows it stood in relative isolation. I mean, how quickly did the neighborhood develop? You think from that point? It was well. It begins to develop fairly quickly as a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, I think the next house built is the Madison Cuts house, which is directly across mm -hmm. Lafayette Square. And then those um, those two streets, Madison and Jackson Place, along the east and west sides of Lafayette Square, begin to develop fairly quickly. I mean, they are the most prominent residential addresses in the country. It's I mean, these that are the is, houses that's amazing. That, is that amazing. are the neighbors to the White House. <laughs> And now I wanted to talk about um, the the actual house inside the house. Um, on, on page 171 is the front hall uh -huh. of one of Washington's most sophisticated spaces. Can you tell us more? How is this space used today? Sure. Well, that is a perfect way to describe the entry hall at Decatur House. It is an incredibly sophisticated space. And it is probably on the interior the, of Decatur House, the place where Benjamin Latrobe's design for the house remains the purest, mm -hmm. right? Has been the least fooled around with okay. over time. Interesting. And it bears a striking resemblance to his design for the Senate vestibule at the Capitol, which um, is sort of famous for the corn cob uh, capital. Mm -hmm. on its columns, those aren't, those aren't mm -hmm. in Decatur House, but it's sort of a scaled down version of mm -hmm. that. The proportions are gorgeous. Latrobe's bl brand of classicism is on full display. It is an incredibly elegant 
uh, entry space. Yes, yes, yes. And then on page 182, 183, there is the drawing room of the Decatur House. Right. Now, what is there and how is it used today? Sure. These are the main entertaining spaces on the second floor of Decatur House, which is one of the unique things about Latrobe's design, that these gorgeous parlors are on the second floor of Decatur House, where they have beautiful views of Lafayette Square. They are some of the most storied entertaining spaces in the Capitol, and they continue to be today. They are used for both programs by the White House Historical Association and are rented for private events. So okay. that tradition of entertaining in these spaces it's going continues. Forward. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Fantastic. And then we have on page 221, 222, and 22 some of the photos of the famous tenants who lived in the Stephen Decatur House. Sure. Uh, images of Martin Martin Van Buren. Sure. And Edward Livingston. Yes. Yes. And who and who else? Sure. So Decatur House, after Stephen Decatur dies and his wife Susan Decatur begins renting the house, is home to, it's rented by foreign ministers from England, from France, from Russia. And then it is rented by three American secretaries of state, uh, Henry Clay, Martin Van Buren, and Edward Livingston, during their tenures as Secretary of State. In fact, it is, I believe, the only private residence in the United States that was home to three sitting secretaries of state during their tenure. But also during this time, another really notable person who lives there is a woman named Charlotte Dupuy. In 1829, Charlotte Dupuy, who is enslaved in the household of Henry Clay and who's living in the slave quarters behind the house, she sues Henry Clay mm. for her freedom and the freedom of her two children. And that the, story is in here. It right. is, in the circuit court of the District of Columbia. This is 17 years before the mm -hmm. Dred Scott case. Mm -hmm. The court ultimately decides against her, but she stays in Washington during the case. Um, Clay goes back to Kentucky, and she stays and works for wages in the household of Martin Van Buren. Uh, so so uh, it is, there is no end to, to, to the to, fascinating stories you're of Decatur right. House. And Catherine, uh, real quickly, yeah. can you tell us about your chapter in this book sure. and, and what the National Preservation sure. effort is going forward? Well, that forward. brings us into the 20th century. Yes. The National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, was bequeathed the house in 1952, uh, and it is one of our very first historic sites. Today, as you said, we have a portfolio of 27 historic sites around the country, um, and it was the National Trust's first permanent headquarters. So it's really important to us as an organization, we're a congressionally chartered nonprofit devoted to saving America's historic places. But you know, Lafayette Square has become such an important part of how preservation happens in the United States. Mm -hmm. First, its owner, Marie Beale, in the 1930s, saves Lafayette, helps to save Lafayette Square um, as it is threatened during the Roosevelt administration. Then she gives the house to the National Trust, which makes it a sort of outpost of mm -hmm. preservation. And then when Lafayette Square is threatened in the 1960s and First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy steps in to again save Lafayette Square, Decatur House is an important part of that effort too. Thank goodness she did that. Indeed. Ah. So, um, so you know, Decatur House in the 20th century is such an important part of the story of how preservation in the United States becomes really a national movement. Yes, yes, yes. Now, where can our viewers in Arlington find your book? Sure. So um, you can go to the Decatur House, which is an amazing place to go, and it's on sale there at their shop. I also um, understand it is on sale at the White House Historical Association's website, and I believe Great. there's a link to that. And then I think you can also buy it on places like Amazon.com. But um, if you're interested in the book, I recommend a visit to Decatur House to I see the property you. when you buy it. Exactly. <laughs> totally worth the, your time to do that. Indeed. And thank you so much. Thank Catherine, you. For, for, for being here and giving us a great description of the, of the photographs in this book and, and a great history. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Please join us again next month for a new edition of the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom.